the passage is still the same, Acts chapter 17, 22 to 34. We're going to focus on 30 and 31. Although the same passage, I guarantee, and you already know that we cannot possibly exhaust the treasure in the Word of God because the reason so, the Word of God is from God. The Word of God is God himself. And God is an infinite individual. There's no way to exhaust even finite human. We can't even exhaust the information in us. We were to cut slide one open and study everything. We cannot. A lot of things we still cannot unearth. Scientists cannot find out what it is. Imagine God. Yes. So rest assured that both hands, one, we will always find treasure in this passage. On the other hand, we are not going to stay here forever because we can stay here forever. With that being said, this passage is very important to us, important to the Christian. As I mentioned in the outline that I sent, this, there are a few points that I want to run through real quick about this passage is God and his sons being honored. This passage is a passage that display, record one of the most important sermons. Why is important sermons? All sermons are important, all gospels are important. But here is a special setting that Paul was head to head, toe to toes, nose to nose with all those elite thinkers, great thinkers, of the world, in the world. Those are intelligent, not only individuals, it's a group a committee of intelligent people. And Paul was given the privilege to preach God, preach the gospel in that setting. That is why this sermon, if anything at all, you want to study one sermon, you want to study this sermon, not my sermon, but Paul's sermon. I'm preaching, the sermon that I'm preaching is preaching Apostle Paul's sermon in which he is preaching at Areopagos or Mars Hills. So it's very important because God and his son being honored, proclaim that there's no, no way anybody can argue against that preaching and logic and reasoning. Well, scripture even though they were not scripture grounded, Paul managed to bring the whole Bible to preach with strong reasoning. Roman, Roman 1, 2, souls, I'm, I'm using this as a present tense, so you will hear present tense. Instead of so then got to hear, I say get to hear based on the actual as if we are sitting under Paul's preaching. So number two, Roman number two soul gets to hear the truth about God and Jesus. Why so important? Because they were the most educated, intelligent, born with it, and had the privilege to study and all of that, yet they never heard the truth. They were coming close, coming close, to almost close, to the point of they were sending a respect and worship to the unknown God written on the altar. altar. So we know that this is something that they were, they are now at this point, having the privilege to hear the truth about God and Jesus. And next two points is the result from point number two, some to salvation, some to condemnation. That's a really serious point to all of us because we are too, no different from these people to hear the truth about God and about Jesus, about the gospel, yet some of us reject and rather go to hell. 
Point number five, a servant of God, namely Apostle Paul, preached at a very important setting. We see this as a milestone, a relic, a serious, important lesson to all of us that we can learn, we should learn from. I mentioned that earlier, but I want to give this a point itself because Apostle Paul was granted by God, blessed by God, graced by God to preach the gospel and to preach everywhere, including this setting. Just like you were called, invited to go to MIT or Yale or Harvard or Cambridge or high elite university to preach to the whole school, the faculty, and the student bodies. This is like that. It's a very important event. And the last point is the application to all of us. Believers throughout centuries, from Paul's time all the way to us, have the privilege to receive the same grace and the same blessing as Paul did in his company. One, we get to glorify God as God glorifies and honors his own son, Jesus. Therefore, we glorify the triune God. And we, from this, get to grow in our faith. To grow in our faith is very important to us Christian, our souls, because we need to feed the word of God, the blessing of God, the washing of the word of God in our life, our sins, our nature. This is a very important personally and also to the whole community of believer, which is sub point number C. Let us see is we understand this, we can minister to one another properly. Because we see how Paul tenderly, carefully, precisely give the gospel and preach to the Gentile, to the non-believer, to those who persecuted Paul, or at this point not exactly like other people were killing him, stoning him. This is her comments and, and attacked him verbally, putting him down. Paul dealt with them in a very godly manner. So we can learn from that by the manner in which we take care of each other and to help each other to grow. Because all of us are given the grace to grow differently. Go through our journey in life beneath the church. And of course, the last point, you guessed it, we are giving, given grace and blessing to evangelize to the lost soul, which we were once in darkness and lost. So this is important, the cycle continues. And all this we see Paul learning how to do it, and not learning, Paul is doing that. We learn from Paul and we learn, we receive and we share and we give. So those are the points I had meditate and study and meditate and I wrote and re rewrote, rewrite, I read and reread. And these are the points I come up with from that meditation. So as always, I have a list of scriptures, passages to support this context of the sermon in which God put in my heart to preach and to share. As I mentioned earlier, the passage is the same, but full of blessing and treasure and powerful instruction because it highlights God, because it, honor, it honors God 
while, Je while, while the Father honors Jesus. Therefore, the whole thing, direct and indirect, honors Jesus. And then we study the main point, which is in verse 30, 31. All of us need to hear, especially, well, whether we're Christian or not Christian, we need to understand the aspect of the judgment of God, the God who judge, the God who is holy and just and righteous. So we will look into that will bring him honor and glory. It will bring us Christian to live a better Christian life. And also to bring this concept when we share with unbeliever, God so willing, they too will understand that the God who is giving free salvation will also judge. So we will study the judgment of God and theologian had studied and and discuss and divide two points that we can learn from. You probably have heard that the, the, the judgment of God, the judgment of the great white throne, and the judgment seat of Christ. We heard that a lot when I was young. I used to be so confused about all of those. And not that I'm any better, but a little bit better. But those other things is not something that you and I can just easily get a little quick. Well, Google now make everything quick <laughs> and you can start it. But deeper than that, it's a concept, it's a spirit behind the, con the information, the concept is in the word of God, which touch our souls. So there is a judgment seat of Christ, and there is the judgment of God. Those two are different from the great white throne. Jesus will, and, and quick, we will go into detail by looking at scripture and study together. And believe me, I'm sure you know that already, each of those cross-reference passage has a lot more cross references in which theologian and scholar and people who who get their PhD or postdoctorate can write about those as textbooks. And I'm grateful for those people who labor hard so that we can learn from them. But at the end of the day, we have ourselves have to go to scriptures and study and meditate and pray on our own as well. Those are only tools. At the end, we go to God. But more than just information and knowledge, these are the blessing, the washing, the cleansing of our soul. In which the next point I subtitle is the great high priest. We have a great high priest this involves a lot have to do with the Hebrew, the Israelite, but also carry through to Christianity. We have a great high priest. Jesus is our great high priest. I should have given you the cross reference, but I now mind I'm just running through ideas and concepts first. Pre-cross and post-cross, meaning before he went up to the cross to lay down his life to save us, he prayed to the Father, which was found in John chapter 17, one of the greatest prayer model in the Bible, one of the greatest. It's a good reminder especially verse 17. And after the resurrection, after he died and rose again, went to heaven, he continued to pray for us in heaven. This is in Hebrew chapter seven, verse 25. We'll look into that in a moment. Just run through the outline real quick. 
So Jesus is our supreme divine judge, and He is a supreme divine judge for the whole world. He will judge angels, fallen angel, in that sense. The holy angel was given by God, granted by God to stay holy. So there was a doctrine, theology on the angelic beings before and after and during what not, but it's not the time for that topic yet. And then we study something profound from the Holy Scripture about God, in which I title this sermon, The Revelation of God. The revealing of God himself, the self-revelation God had chosen to reveal himself to creature like us who don't deserve anything. And that in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, he certified, he clarified his son, Jesus of Nazareth, was crucified and died and rose again to say the stamp of approval, this is my actual divine son from heaven. And then I have a long cross reference for you and I, not just for you, for me, to read. This is the food to our soul, the medicine to our sickness. Romans chapter 3, you can start from chapter 1, but in for our, for our context here, relating to Jesus as our supreme judge, Romans chapter 3, verse 9, all the way to Romans chapter 8, verses, all the way to Romans chapter 8, verse 39. Many chapters, but I, when you start reading Romans, or Romans chapter 9, chapter 3, verse 9, I don't think, logically, I don't think you can put down, put it down. You will... I won't guarantee, because you probably won't. Some of you will. But follow the flow of my, my thinking. You will not be able to put down until you read all the way to Romans chapter 8. And then I would like to read today in conclusion Roman chapter 8 itself, a few verses toward the end, verses 20, 27 to 39. This is an outline. So go again. This is our outline. I gave you a list of important points of the sermon of this passage. The judgment of God, talking about the judgment seat of Christ or known as the judgment of God as well. And also that sub-point to show that Jesus and God are one, although they are two distinct individual, but they are one entity. Second Corinthians chapter five. Again, this is on in a, in a Google Drive or uh, the leader share with a you guy accordingly. Or Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 12. Those two are very much comparable, complement each other. Known as, more known as the judgment seat of Christ. And the second one, known as the great white throne, or the final judgment, or the final state found in Matthew chapter 31 through 46. And then coupled with that to support that, Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15. And of course, I already gave you the great high priest, John chapter 17, and also post-cross Hebrews 7, 25. 
In conclusion, Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7, the certification of the of who Jesus Christ is. Basically, Jesus Christ is a Messiah, Jesus Christ is a man who God who became man, a man God, and Jesus became a divine person after that. And of course, for our personal growth, Romans chapter 3, verse 9, all the way to chapter 8, verse 39. And we'll wrap up at the last portion, 27 to 39 of chapter 8. Before I start, before I read the main text, I just want to remind you that the last time we closed, we ended at the Gospel of John, chapter 5, that Jesus clearly said that the Father authorized him because he is the Son of God, he is God himself, and more than that, he came down to do the job to fulfill all requirements that God wanted to do to offer us human salvation to become a man and die for our sin, but he will judge us after that. So we left with that stern warning of the time that we are running out. Could be Christ return anytime, or could be our life could be just over tonight. A decision is critical while we are still alive and while we are still logically intact. I say that because not all of us logically intact, but just relatively okay. We have to make a decision to go to God, go to Christ, and acknowledge our sin and repent from our sin for forgiveness. Not only once, yes, salvation took place only one time, but every day, every time, every time the Spirit strikes our soul to tell us that we need to repent. We need to run to God. We cannot be hard in our heart. As Hebrew said, that today you hear the voice, do not harden your heart. So this is critical that we hear this message. And then the moment our life is over, a chance to go to God is over. It's very important. So we remember that. I'm sure you remember that as John chapter 5, verse 19 to 29. Wait, yeah, 19 to 29. But let us read the great sermon that Paul delivered at a very special meeting. No other place than Mars Hills or Arius Pagos to the Athenians, as known as very important, very intelligent, very powerful, very rich people in every aspect, even the look of those people. And they, that's why they believe they are, they are from God and others just animals or birds. Our beloved Apostle Paul was given this, granted this grace and blessing and power to stand against all of that if we were to put a picture of a movies or story or legend, 300 Spartans against hundreds of thousands of warriors, except this is only one, and except this one is powerful more than the 300 Spartans. Apostle Paul won the battle. So start in verse 22, when they invited him to speak, to preach. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Aristagos, and said, Men of Athens, 
I perceive that in every way you are very religious. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. You've read this many times, you've heard this many times. I'm glad you are familiar with this because the word of God will live in you. We can at least learn something that Paul's very respectful, very kind, very professional, very effective in addressing people and most intelligent and logical because he has to walk carefully. He dealing with his opponent who has all the weapons. And he did not want, later on he wrote, do not offend the Greeks or the Jews or the church or the unbelievers for the sake of giving them the gospel. And he rightly so is doing quite well. I mean, the best right here giving respect, and then start to unveil the truth about their weaknesses, but still with respect and logic and reasoning. Very kind, powerful but kind. For I, for us, I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, object of your worship. Contrast with object of your worship. And then he will talk about it to an individual divine God later on. I also found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Perfect. He took the opponent, he find, he find the agreeable point starting point that they cannot disagree with him. Also, along from men of Athens, and you're religious, and you have a lot of object in your worship, that nothing Paul was offensing, of, um, putting them down or anything, just stating the fact. And they cannot disagree to the point of, to the unknown God. Here is a switch. Here is the key point. There is a high heart button to press a nucleus gospel bomb. What therefore you worship as unknown, unknown, not knowable. You cannot know this. This I proclaim to you. The God, not an object anymore, who made the world, who made all the everything in the world and everything in it, including that those objects and and and, and the temples and all objects. So he declared immediately, my God is supreme and only, is a supreme being and only God. The creator of the universe, heaven and hell, being Lord of heaven and earth. There's no higher court than God, even though they're sitting on the highest court on earth. Does not live in a temple. They were in a soul made in a temple in Greek here. Made by man, no as he served by human hands as though he need anything. All of this is to another way to say that all your useless objects staying there and somebody have to go and dust and wipe and so on, so on, and put some food, something. My, my God doesn't need any that because he's God. Those things are not God. Since, in, since he himself gave to all mankind life and breath and everything, you owe it to him. You are mankind. God give you breath. They cannot disagree that. Because the flow of the logic and reasoning lend all of them into this owing God's appreciation and worship and grateful praise because of life and breath that God gave them. And then Paul in anthropology and sociology and psychology and prideful nation that they think they are, the only one that belong to the God that they don't know. 
And Paul said, no, God made everybody. Verse 26. He made from one person every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of the dwelling place. God, the one who assigned that from one person, so he owned, continued to say he is supreme. He's supreme. And now he revealed the deeper aspect, nature, and essence of God. Not he, only he's supreme, he's powerful, he controls his Lord and all of that, and he's alive. But he is a kind and loving and gracious God who does everything to allow you, who've been walking away from God for thousands of years, to come back and to receive him, come back, return to him and receive salvation. He said, so they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And Paul take, took the opportunity to turn it around and prove to them that then stop being like who you are now, worship idol. Stop committing the sin. Being then God offspring, we ought not to think that we, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, image formed by the art of the imagination of man. Clever way to say, intelligent way to say, unbeatable way to say that you need to stop worship idols. Powerful, intelligent, kind still. And then he went to the heart of the matter. All of this, the creator and the divine God and the, the loving God, the caring God, give called common grace that all of us live, whether you're a believer or not, you still have breath, you still have the sun and the rain, the life and the joy relatively fine throughout your life. Minus all the troubles that we created for ourselves because of sins. But in general, God gave us common grace to live and have relatively happy life. We're the one who kill each other. We're the one who fall into sin. We're the one who, who hurt one another, hurt ourselves, and so on, so on. But even that, you still breathe without paying a penny to the oxygen that God gave us. And the sunlight, and the rain, and the food, and the water, and the joy in life. Again, the sorrow we created for ourselves. Now it's time for us to know that the grace, the borrowed time that God lent us is over. The heart of the matter, verse 30 and 31, in which we study the great white throne, the judgment seat of God, of Christ, the judgment of God, the final state of the judgment, all of that based on these two verses. The time of ignorance, oh, another point, I acknowledge, I know, some of you might have thought or have questioned, don't worry, I will address that, when it said that God overlooked their sins in the past. What does that mean? Okay, we'll talk about that. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. People ask this question all the time. What happened to those people 5,000 years ago in whatever? country they want to talk about, in China, in Africa, and everywhere, that they, they did not hear the name of Jesus, the gospel was not spread until the early first century. 
until now. So what happened? The question designed to say that two things, God is not fair. God is not fair. And two, Christianity is not logical. It's fake. And Paul, the scripture clearly wrote about that. Not ashamed of it. Not shy about it. Because there's an answer to it. There's an answer. Again, that's not the time to talk about it. I just want to focus on one point that the God who made everything, the God who controlled everything, the God who's so kind to us, all sinners, the God who died for us, and the God who promised to take us home, the same God will judge. That is our main point. If we were to ask, what was the sermon about? I want you to at least know and remember and understand what we are pursuing, what we are searching is that knowledge, that information. Better yet, search the person, the God, the information of that person, of that God, of that Savior, of that judge. Because it is serious to the Father, serious to God himself. Number one. Number two, it is serious to our souls, each one of us. Each one of us will stand in front of him. Each one of us will have to give an answer. Each one of us have to face it sooner or later. It's a very important topic. And thirdly, it is a very important topic because we are responsible to take care of one another in the household of faith of God. Paul himself and many other, Jesus also, to the apostles, the Peters and all, and John, remind us again and again and again to take care of brothers and sisters in the faith. The strong carry the weak. The policy do not leave any comrade behind the enemy line. You all will get shot. You all will get wounded. You all will get hurt along the way during your battle on earth. You have time to read this for fun. Pilgrim Progress, a very famous classic book. But the point is understanding all of this aspect of God and his beloved son, our savior and our judge. We know, we would know, we should know how to live our life, our daily living, our journey toward the end. And that includes taking care of each other. The last word Jesus said is to take care of each other. Besides, go tell the world about me. He said, take care of each other. So no one comes to take care of you and protect you except by giving the right to you to do that in the church. So he said, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. Clearly, the scripture unmistakably said that God will judge the world. Scripture said, be sure to this, that sin will not go unpunished. And this help all of us. Remind us for our first love when we met Christ, when we first received salvation. And now it's time to refresh our screen, so to speak. Reboot, reformat our heart, our soul, our life. God, 
has fixed a day in which he will judge the world. In righteousness, in this word, in righteousness, it's clearly God will judge the world. It's already said it, but in righteousness, it's too clearly said that God will punish the world because the world had plunged into sin since day one of our early beginning of human history. God cannot do anything other than what is right. The right is to punish and to punish sin, and he will do that. And that is very important for us to understand. God will punish sin. And then at this phrase, Paul injects something very powerful. Rather, somebody is very powerful. The term here is so intelligent, so clever, so subtle, so powerful. The gospel, Christ himself, the whole gospel, Jesus Christ, the son of God, who has a power equal to God to judge the world, yet he came, to be, came down from heaven to become a man so that he can die to pay for our sins so that he can give us the gospel. I mean, give us salvation, not the gospel. So that he can also judge human. In one phrase, it's a lot deeper than this that Paul understood them clearly because Greek believed that matter, human, are evil, must die, must be gone. Soul are pure. Soul cannot be tainted by sin, by anything bad, so soul will live on. Very, at first, similar to Christianity, but totally are. Why? Because this, they disregarded us human beings, which God created in his own image. And when they disregarded salvation, not only spirit, but bodily, Greek has no hope in that. Paul disarmed all of that. Greek believed flesh is evil, spirit is good. To the point of spirit is all good, every spirit is good. Christianity says no, spirit are bad too. All sinner, not only sin but of the flesh, outside the flesh, but the spirit. So Paul undo all of that by saying God will appoint an important person equal to himself to judge the world. Therefore, this person has to be powerful, divine, intelligent, strong, mighty, and have a big brain and computer to know everything about everybody and know accurately, righteously, condemn everyone to go to hell properly. Wow, that's a, such a, a powerful person. But that person, that great judge, was a man in which Paul introduced the man Christ, the man God, the Messiah, who the Hebrew, the Jews, know that the Messiah will come in person in the line of David. Powerful writing, powerful speech powerful statement here. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Clear, assertive, confident, talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, talk about the pure doctrine of the gospel. Sure, you all know the gospel of God, the power of God, which is the power, we studied this in the past, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it's a power to those who are called 
to salvation. Sure enough, scriptures are very powerfully so divine, so God, God-like, connected to each other so perfectly, like a perfect puzzle. In verse 32, 33, 34. Now when they heard this, of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, make fun of it. And you at first, what, so, what, what's wrong with that? Um, they mock, it's normal, right? They don't believe. True, but these are two things, let me tell you. These are intelligent, these people are intelligent, educated, high thinker people. What does that mean then? It, me it means they are strong, brain strong, mind strong, reasoning people who follow the strong presentation of the doctrine of God and the gospel from the very beginning to the end, which they cannot deny or argue or disagree. For them to have all of that conclude in the silly mocking way, and that is absolutely crazy, absolutely reprobate minded. So this is the gospel that was given and offered by the grace and loving kind God through his apostle and to only bring these people to condemnation. It's important application to all of us when we hear the gospel, when we hear Christ die for our sin and when we offer to receive salvation by going to Christ in repentance and ask him to be your Lord and Savior throughout your life until you go home but you choose, refuse, and you have no reason to disagree all the great information in the Bible. You say, I, I would believe, but I, it doesn't make sense. What part that love doesn't make sense? Or the Bible contradicts itself. What part? Find one. Find one contradiction in the Bible, and you can throw away the whole Bible. Those people who so, so, so confident, especially in a college camp campus, and say that the Bible full of contradiction. Especially those people who don't go, even go to college, and online, oh, they talk like they're so intelligent. They quote here and there, and I used to go there. My wife and I used to go there when we were silly, um, debate with them, and, and ask them, Just "Give me one. Give me one. I play it. Give me, give me ten points of contradiction." You know where I'm going. Oh, uh, give me just five. Oh, just give me one. Give me one. They cannot find one. What appear to be contradiction is a paradox that easily explained. But anyway, the point is, people, it's not that they do not understand, that they don't agree with the logic and reasoning. For example, I'll give you a simple example. We talk about um, monotheism and pantheism, okay? People believe in one God only, people believe in many gods. Come together, okay, just one simple, simple logic. As we come together, one side says, I believe this, and the other side, I believe that, okay? Obviously, we believe that's only one God, I believe only one God, and I would say this to my opponent, say that, define the word God in terms of numbers. God is supreme, God is the highest. What does it mean, highest? The comparative between degree, between um, quality, mean only one. God, the term God, the word God, the definition of God means one and only. Yeah. Okay, if God more than, there's more than one God, maybe ten, whatever. Those pagans have many gods. And what make all of them become the supreme, the highest, the most powerful, the godness of him, if everybody like him? That alone dismiss the argument. Forget it. You don't make sense. Just to talk about God, only one, 
there are thousand million countless of God. Okay. That alone. So it's not about doesn't make sense. Christianity makes perfect sense. Christianity, the gospel, and Jesus Christ revealed God make perfect sense. It's not that we cannot understand it. We refuse to understand that. We refuse to accept that because we love our darkness. Jesus himself said that. In the gospel, in the book of John chapter 3, we remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And you read only a few more verses and you say, oh, Jesus said that the reason you don't believe because you love darkness. Sin is more than we can imagine. Sin is not something that you think people can fight. We need God, we need gr the grace of God. We need the blood of Christ, we need scripture, we need the Holy Spirit, we need the church, we need each other. But ultimately we need God. The only one person that can help us is God. This person reject and mock this people. And other, on the contrary, but other said, we will hear you again about this. Meaning we uh, make sense. We want to hear more. That means they accepted the gospel. But it's not right away fully because they were so confused. Why? Because they packed with high octane, high voltage of intelligence, IQ, and information, and knowledge, and degree. So much in that, that intertwined with their pride, their nature, their ability, their look, and their wealth. So it's hard for them to let that all go. Nevertheless, the phrase here, the concept here show the kindness of the Spirit of God and the Scripture and God Himself to allow them to come closer to God, even though in a slow pace. Sure enough, so Paul went out from their midst, meaning Paul done his mission. Some people critic our days, or some, I don't know, our days or before, mock Paul right here that he lost the battle at Moss Hill. It's not true. Let me stand for this concept that Paul did not lose the battle. So how powerful, it's so powerful like this Paul's preaching and logic and reasoning and the Holy Spirit, how come not all the, the council at small hills became Christian, and all of a sudden, everybody, those powerful thinkers, became Christian and baptized and so on. That's the goal to show that even the highest intelligent thinkers, educated people, without God, grace, God, sovereignty, are foolishness, are dead. Clearly, Paul talked about that. But not all did not just total waste. Some believe too, but that's secondary. Primary, Paul was victorious because he stood against the world preaching the gospel and God. That's in itself a victorious, it's a, it's a trophy. Paul won, he spoke, he preached, he proclaimed. Powerfully, he was not ashamed. He's not afraid. He was not a coward in front of those powerful people. So it's a winner. But on the human side, in verse 34, but some people, some small remnant, believe. Some men join him and believe. There you go. And people, the critics say, well, it's so little compared to all. Well, it's not about numbers. Even there is zero convert at that day. The Bible, I mean, the mission is still successful because Paul gave more. God said in Isaiah, through Isaiah the prophet, that his word that left his mouth will not come back void. 
were accomplished. What does that mean? When God said, I'm God, I send my son to die for your sin. You need to repent, you need to bow to him. You need to go to him as Lord God and Savior, receive salvation, or you go to hell if you reject him. And then God's word return to heaven, accomplished. That means when the gospel go out, when people reject and go to hell, like God intend for them to go to hell. Okay, you deserve to go to hell because you reject my help. So what's so losing about that? It's a winning. How about God said if you accept the gospel, worship me, worship my son, repent from your sin and follow me, follow my son, follow the Bible, follow the teaching of the Christianity, you go to heaven. And people believe that and follow until this day. And that of course, obviously, people say that's that's a winning. Yeah, win both ways. So we talk about the winning of easy, easily spot. Some men join in belief, among whom also were Dionysius, Dionysius name that everybody knew because he was the judge. He was the head leader. He was out of Areopagite. Areopagite is Areopagus, the judge of Areopagus or the judge in Mars Hill. Important man. If this leader, like the boss, believe, you little guys just maybe, I don't know, little, little guys, intelligent scholar and philosopher, but nothing close to this guy mocking that you are being stupid. But the gospel and salvation doesn't depend on how you view someone great become Christian. It's not. A lot of times people say, oh, we have so-and-so, the movie stars, the celebrity, and the rich man until they become a Christian. Can you imagine people will follow? Not so. We have plenty of celebrities and intelligent and rich people became Christian, and the world still go along on their ways to hell as usual. What saved people is not other people, impressive individuals become Christian. What saved people is Christ, the gospel, and the sovereignty and the grace of God. That's all it is. And what sent people to hell is not God is evil, God is unkind. It's because sin deserves hell. God doesn't have to do anything to send sins and sinners to hell because they are going there already. God only facilitates, makes sure they are on their way to hell. And they stay there forever. And that's a footnote I want to I share this many times. When sinners prosper, and whereas the other sinners is suffering, and people say, see, you don't believe in God, that's why you're suffering. That is even better than the sinners who are prosperous. Because people, when they're prosperous, when they are powerful, they're rich, they're healthy, they're beautiful, they're famous, there's no way for them to turn to God. Suffering brings people to their knees in which godly suffering brings to salvation. Worldly grief brings to death, brings death. But back here, we see this famous person, famous, this judge here, became a Christian. I would love to meet him. And I'm sure he's intelligent. We go to heaven, we all probably become intelligent and clean and so on. But I just curious to meet him. And a woman by the name of Damaris. And again, she is very famous in that culture. Everybody knows her and other 
with them as well. So people believe. But the tone of this writing is not so much about look, oh, people all turnovers, a big turnover, and people. Cry. It's not about that. That is insignificant. The point that this passage heavily weighted on is the honor, the glory of God and his son, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and the final judgment day. That is what this passage is all about. What's that about? It's about honoring God, who God is, honoring Jesus, what he has gone through. At the end, he deserved. He deserved worship, but every tongue, every knee shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And then for us Christians who receive salvation to forever remember the kindness, the mercy, the grace, the love of God. And which help us, which help us to go to him in repentance throughout our life. Paul said, the kindness of God brings repentance. We receive special love and kindness. Even though I said this before, that non-Christian, non-believer still receive the common grace. That's more than enough. But us, now we adopt it. We become God's children. He loves us. And you will learn more and more. Even though we say we're Christian, we know our God, we should remember this God that the Greek could not know to the unknown God could be our God that we, God revealed himself, would, but we don't know him. We should wake up. Maybe we too don't know this God, even though we're Christian, how that work? It works fine. Every Christian grow at the stage. We believe in Jesus, we believe the gospel, we become Christian, even though we don't know everything about God. But it's a shame that we don't grow to know this God. And this sermon, this passage, this series, help us to know more about our God. So this is the weight of the sermon, of the message that Paul gave to Athenian. You said, that's a lot, that's so much, that's heavy, it's good. A lot, heavy, so much, anything that like that nature is good for us. But God would not leave you and me, his children, as an orphan, he promised. He knew before he left, he prayed to the Father, to keep us, to take care of us. And it's a good reminder, not to say we, okay, now become lazy, become indifferent, no. It should encourage us to go to him in worship, and love, and repentance, and the same way to others. Jesus prayed for us before he died, before he died on a cross. And John 17 beautifully said in the first five verses, the whole chapters, of course. But let me read five verses here as we close. Not just here, but we go to um, reveal the heart of Jesus while he prayed for us in the book of Romans. When Jesus has spoken this word, he lifted up his eye to heaven and said, this is a, he was grieving to the point of drip sweat blood father the hour has come glorify your son that your son may glorify you since we have given since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him the sovereignty of god the choice of god who give salvation to whom he please and this is salvation and this is eternal life. This is living forever with God without condemnation. That 
They know you. They know God. The word know here is not had knowledge. The know here is gnosko means to they know and love you. The only true God, monotheism, the supreme being. And to know Jesus Christ, he spoke of himself as a third person because this is how he highlight the Savior, the Messiah. They know and love God. They know and love Jesus Christ. That is salvation. To believe, to know, to believe, and to love, to obey. That's the word gnosko. Whom you have sent. Whom you have sent. Talk about this mission of self-sacrificial to the point of death and shameful death on a cross. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have, you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you, we had this together before the world even exists. This is self exist supreme being, God the only that the Greek or the Gentile could not come up with that concept even when we told them clearly. And you will be blessed when or if you read this passage to know, to have the confidence, to know, to have the assurance, to feel the love, to know the love, to experience the love that how much God, especially Jesus, loved us. He prayed for us because he knew that we were going to go through a rough journey in life. He asked the Father to keep us. In verse 9 through 11, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the whole world, but to, for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All minds are yours, and yours are mine. Talk about the divinity of Christ. And I am glorified in them. God's being glorified in the church. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world that I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. Jesus plead with the Father to keep us. This implied that we can go astray and to hell. However, he gave us eternal life. So the Father, by his sovereign grace and choice and love, and Jesus requested to keep us in his hand. Which you have given me, that they may be one. And listen to this. They may be one as we are one. And later on, they may be one with us. We are to be one with the, the triune God. That's mind boggling. How could that happen? Obviously, by the prayer of Jesus to the Father, by the kindness and the grace and power, mighty hand of the Father who protected us. But one more thing that Jesus said in verse 17. Purify them, sanctify them, clean them. Because he knows we need it. Sanctify them in the truth. How? What? Your word is true. The scripture is the only instrument which connects divine and mortal. Human to God, God to us, through the Spirit of God. You and I, all of us can read scripture, mean nothing, or you and I can read scripture, we break down in tears, in joys, in awe, in repentance, in worship. That's a difference between the chosen and the rejected one, the unchosen one. And you can read this on your own. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Wow. We talk about the glory of God, which God would not share with anyone in the 
um, Old Testament talk about the glory that you give to his son makes sense, but he gave to the church. That they may be one as even as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. The father is to love the, the church as he loved his own son. Without that, the judgment of Christ will come to crush all of us. Some deeper than another, nevertheless, we all will be punished. But how are we gonna escape that? This is the prayer and the act that follow from this Jesus took your sin and my sin and nailed it to the cross. There's the only way we escape that judgment is God judge our sin on his own son because he loved us as he loved his son. That is mind boggling. That is absolutely unthinkable that people like us, some are more than another, nevertheless, dirty, ugly, wretched, for anyone to care for, let alone die for. God the Father didn't die, but he sent his son to die, so it's no less to see your son die. Even more painful to see your loved one die, especially for the cause of these wretched creatures. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me. Jesus love us like a friend that don't want to let friend go. Talk about that. It's a lot deeper than what I can express now. We all have friends, we all have loved ones, we all have family, if we all want to be together. And sometimes our wish is not granted. Sometimes we are apart, but sometimes we are apart forever. I pray to God, God forbid, that you experience that your loved one gone forever to hell or gone forever because of tragic death. I cannot share, I cannot express, I cannot say enough. I might have experienced all of that. I desire, deep desire, that they also whom you have given me may be with me and where? Where I am in heaven to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Talk about something beyond human comprehension. Talk about love, talk about grace, we talk about power, we talk about mighty power. It's a lot of illustration I want to share, especially in this season that I lost most of my family, I lost most of my friends, I lost most of my tens. 50% of the population went down to the grave. And I don't know how many percentage went to hell after that. Jesus continued to pray for us after he went to heaven. His job was done, but he continued to pray. Why he pray for us? after he already prayed, after we already received salvation and the security and the, the engagement ring, the, the, the promise, which is the Holy Spirit, Paul said, to carry us, to wash us, to cleanse us, to discipline, to teach, 
carry us through because no flesh, no sin, no dirtiness, no wickedness can enter the presence of God except the Holy Spirit who washes us. But Jesus continued to pray for us in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save, he is able to save to the uttermost those who have drawn near to God through him. He able to save the most wretched and all wretched sinners to bring them to God through himself. How? Two things, son, he is always alive, forever. Jesus cannot die, Jesus cannot get tired, Jesus cannot take a break. It's not that he cannot because he was chained down to his post. Jesus doesn't need any of that because he's powerful. And two, he's loving. He always alive or lives to make intercession for them. If, when you and I hear this, there's nothing happen in a brain cell, spark, a heart, a desire, a soul, toward God and toward Jesus in a worshipful, grateful, repentful way, I don't think anything can. And I'm personally grateful beyond words that Jesus should save me or any of us. Reality, he did. How do we know? A life of faith and obedient and repentful. A life of love, a life that walks, as Paul said, follow him as he followed Christ. Love, kind, gracious, truth, and all of that. Paul did an amazing job, to say the least, to preach this sermon. And I highly recommend for you to not memorize like mechanically. I want you to read this. If I were you, I'd start doing that to read this passage daily. I don't know how many times a day I read this passage. Once I have to preach, I have to study, I have to make sure I handle it carefully, precisely, respectfully, worshipfully. But other, I found myself drawn to this passage, to this God of the passage personally. Take time, take time to receive this blessing as well. Doesn't matter where you are in life, you may be not even a Christian, but you're not intelligent like this Athens, Athenians, and anything close to this, yet you can still have the privilege to receive salvation through this. Just sheer logic alone, reasoning alone, you should bow to this God. But if you've been a Christian, you've been a Christian for a while, you walk through this mud mire of sinful world, and you have some ups and downs, some victorious, some defeated life. This passage will not magically, but supernaturally bring you back to God, to Christ. Put you back in your first love when you first met him. And continue to worship him. Continue to love God. Continue to repent. To do so, God expressed, Jesus himself expressed, if you love me, love others, take care of one another as I take care of you. Love others as, as I love you. How have Jesus loved us? He died for us. Die for others. Die for others. Others mean Christian. And if you, not just a baby Christian today, or maybe yesterday, only last Thursday in Bible study. 
joking. You are welcome to the family of Christ. You are blessed because God has loved you and blessed you and received you as any one of the Christian all the way to Father Abraham. That's how much privilege each one of us, even we just receive Jesus in the last hour. You said, how about the last minute I just did it? I don't know about that. We'll ask him about that. I'm just joking, you know. So all in all, to give God the glory. By the way, I'm trying to cut my sermon short, if you notice that. This is very short. <laughs> Honestly. How loving, how great, how awesome is this? If you were to look at Romans chapter 8, I mean Romans chapter 3, verse 9, start from verse 9 and talk about, start from verse 10, it is, none is righteous. God will judge us in righteousness. None is righteous, that means we all go to hell. Thank you very much. No, not one, not even you, he said. No one understand, no one seek for God all have turned aside together they have become worthless no one that's good not not even one their throat as an open grave they use their tongue to deceive to hurt to kill the venom the venom of asp is under their lips deadly i saw a cartoon i captured that i saw true the guy spoke and Look like open his mouth and there's an arrow come out and then you know, drop him and hit the other person and they go like this. That reminds me of this verse. Words can kill. Kill the soul of a person. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Not bitter melon, we like bitter melon. Thank God for that. He made that. Bitterness. And their feet are swift to shed blood, and their path are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they know not, they have not known. There is no, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the commentary of human beings. Whether thought, words, or action, and because of that we deserve hell. In verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been revealed. Well, you can read through. But I want to read, I want to skip and conclude our sermon today. Since we're doing fine, make it simple and short. I'm happy about that. Honestly, I feel like I didn't preach yet and then I'm quitting. I'm not quitting, I'm concluding. <laughs> Pay attention to this, not by might, by human flesh or intelligence, by humility, by humbleness, by the grace of God, by the bless, blessed blessing of God to soul, Christian, listen. 27 to 39, I'll read it quickly, I will not make comments, but I'm not promising either. And he who searched he who searches hard know what is mine is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints. The Holy Spirit pray to God for the believer, that's the Holy Spirit, according to the will of God, that's God, two individual working together to pray to the Father, to the triune God, for us, verse 27. And verse 28, 29 is a famous passage here. And we know, we certain, we know this for certain that those who love God, not only believe, but love God. Question is, do you love God? 
I know you know God. I know you probably believe in God. Do you love God? Do you have love in your being, to love, in your heart to love God? For those who love God, all things work together for good. All things for those who are called according to his purpose. We are called by his sovereign purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he foreknew the word Gnosko, he, he loved us before we even born. For those he have loved us before we even born and greet him. He also predestined. He predestined us. Predestination doctrine is clearly said that a lot of people, even the others camp side of the Christian, they call Armenian, they don't believe in predestination. Is that we have to make choice. Yes, we have to make choice, but that choice, that correct choice is given to us by God, by the predestination. We also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. We are slowly, some of us, but all of us are conformed to become like Jesus, believe it or not, through everything in order that he might be the firstborn prototokos, mean the supreme one among many brothers, among us. And those whom he predestined, he also called, whom he called, he also justified. Justified means he declared as righteous on a cross, on his son's life, death, amen. And those whom he justified, he also, this word is, unthinkable, it's hard to even say it, let alone take the concept in. He also glorified. God glorified us, sinner, don't even deserve salvation. That is absolutely one of the hardest concepts in the Bible. And verse 34 talk about Christ, Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, the gospel here. Who is at the right hand of God is a judge. Wow, die, rose, and judge. He who indeed is, what? In the seating for us. He did all of that, he still prayed for us. Wow. You know, we should take this to heart and take it home and take it home every minute, every hour, every day. Read this, meditate on this before we even start to open our eyes and breathe in the morning while we breathe already, before we open our eyes. He said, before I open my eyes, my alarm bother me. You should, med you should meditate on this. You should say, Jesus, thank you for praying for me. What I should not deserve this. Then Paul posed a rhetorical, powerful, eternal question. Who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness? Nakedness is not talk about without clothes. Nakedness talk about poverty, dirt poor, that you cannot even afford a pair of socks or danger, or sword. How about guns? Yeah, sword is gun too. It is, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all this thing, we are more than conquerors. Through him, we are conquered. Remember, when you are defeated because of a flesh and sin, remember, we are conquered through him. Therefore, go to him. Therefore, stay with him. 
We are more than conquered through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, holy angel, or demon angel, fallen angel, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, nor no nada, Spanish state, and all creation, and all creation, both seen and unseen, will be able to separate us from the love of God in our beloved Lord God and Savior, Christ Jesus, our Lord. We Christian children of God understand this. More than understand this, we love this scripture, the Holy Spirit, ultimately God himself. Who can have this privilege except children of God? Who are we to be called children of God except for his purpose and choice? Now that he has, let us go from here to live accordingly to fit our name to be his children, to fit the honor, the name, the fame, the glory of the Father, to fit, to appreciate, to offer back to what we cannot pay back, to Christ who died for us, who now is our Lord and judge. To the unknown God now is revealed. To the unknown God now is in the middle. To the unknown God is now clearly revealed to us through his Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.